I remember my first hospital visit as a minister in Texas. I was 24. I thought I knew what I was doing. You know better. One of our students gets in a really bad car accident. Fast forward, the good news is she's great. All good there. But I got the call, hey, this has happened to this hospital and this ER, you stroll past the front desk. Don't worry about security, um, just go right back. ER room, this number, okay, done. Um, I'm like, I can do this, I got this, I'm 24, I'm in ministry, I can know how to handle this, I'm all in, says the guy who passes out at the sight of any needle anywhere, I'm on the floor. My wife is right there. Um, it is true. Uh, I walk into this hospital room. Why are the hospital rooms 80 bajillion degrees? What is this? It encourages the passing out. Uh, I walk, it's about me, right? It's not, obviously. But I walk in and I see Jerry. Jerry's one of our life group leaders. Jerry's in full scrubs. He's the lead nurse that night that his daughter is in a car accident. And so dad is pulling double duty here. He's watching over his daughter and he sees this 24 year old kid come in the room. I'm like, Jerry, how can I help? What do I need to do? What's going on? And he looked at me y'all. He said, sit down. <laughs> I said, what? I'm great. I'm here to help. I'm 24. And he's like, you don't know any, sit down now. And he goes, Gary, you're white as a ghost and you're about to pass out. I said, no, I'm not. Yes, you are sit down. And I kid you not, dad leaves his daughter. And I said, you're not leaving her. And he said, no, I'm, I'm leaving her. She's going to be fine. You are not. I will be right back. He sits, I, he laughed, sits me in a chair inside her ER room. There are bells and whistles and things going off everywhere. And he comes back with a green can of Sprite. There's no really color of Sprite, but that's green. And one of those straws, if you're a parent, it's one of those extenders on the end where you're like four years old and you can point it anywhere. He brought that straw back to me as if I was four years old, said, hey buddy, here you go. She became fine. I had no idea what I was doing. I needed a deacon pretty bad in that moment. There are pros at this. I was 0 for 1 from the plate, hospital visits. Part number two. I was like, I'm not gonna fail this hospital visit, so let's do this one right. I'm bringing my buddy Hayes with me. Hayes was our middle school pastor at the time, um, and he goes, all right, I'm with you, because two guys, you can't fail in this moment. We got both of us, like nothing could go wrong here. So we get in the little Nissan Frontier, where like Eye of the Tiger is probably blaring. Top Gun's like, like guitar anthem is going. We are on the way to the hospital. We can do this. We've got this. We're not passing out. Everything's gonna be fine. On the way there, we're supposed to go see a sweet lady whose husband is having a hard time, but we get a call, hey, I need you to go see this guy. You don't know him, here's a name, go have fun. Got it, okay. Um, Hayes is two years, three years younger than me, and we're just like, we don't know what we're doing. I have any idea, but hey, here's our name. We'd love to pray over you. We walk in this room, patient's here, head of the patient is here. Hayes walks over to this side, hello, sir, how are you? I walk on this side, um, grab that side rail, hello, sir, how are you? And all I remember, and I remember a lot, but this is the main thing. Uh, he has a sheet over him completely. All you can see is his head. So we walk in and I'm at the side rail. And I'm like, I could tell he was fully coherent. There's not a tube, anything. Like there's no boop, boop, there's nothing. Like there's nothing hooked up to this man. Sir, how are you? Can we pray for you? And all I hear, kid you not, come closer. In my head, I'm going, sir, I'm pretty close pretty close. We're like, we're gonna be hugging it out in a minute. I don't even know you. I get closer. Hayes comes in closer. He goes, come closer. About to kiss this guy on his cheek in a minute. This is not gonna go well. He leans in. I kid you not, 100% honest before the Lord. Can you take off my handcuffs? And I sprint back. <laughs> nice guy. He was approachable. But he needed something. And I was like, sir, I, I literally, and they teach you this, the more you do hospitals, it's like you come near the patient, like prodigal son, Jesus approached them, you take a step toward them, you're not afraid of them. But at 24, and Hayes, Hayes is 21, I'm going, what are we doing? I said, I come back, I did take another step towards him, and I, uh, trembling like I am now, you people are scary. Uh, trembling, I said, sir, uh, I can't do that, but I can pray for you. And we had this incredible 
conversation, but we almost quickly went over two, and on the way home, we stopped by one more spot, the last visit. We had heard about this lady, we had heard that her husband was in really rough shape, he was passing away from cancer, and so Hayes and I are talking in the car, okay, um, Lord, would you just be with us, because I can't imagine what that would be like. So we walk up to her room, knock on the doors, her husband's room, hospice, and so she opens really the front door of what had become their home recently. Husband was under anesthesia the whole time. We never spoke to him, prayed over him, but y'all never forget it. This lady, mid-50s, talked about Jesus in a way that I had really never heard anybody talk about Jesus. We stayed in that room an hour, and we didn't talk much. She kept peppering us with questions. We asked her a little bit about, hopefully a lot of it about her life. But hospital visits, if you've done one, there's a lot of deacons in here. They know. It's, it's sometimes it's pretty quick. You want to make sure you're there, but you also want to give that patient time to rest. She just taught us about Jesus for an hour. Y'all, I've never seen anything like that kind of approachability. We get back to the little Nissan Frontier, and we sit there. It's hot in Texas in the summer. We turn on the AC, and we don't move. We stay in park. And two guys at 22 and probably 24, 25, we just sat there for 10, 15 minutes just talking about this lady. We'd never seen anything like that. She was awesome. Let me rephrase that. Christ in her, changing her, was brilliant to watch. Even in her circumstances, she was, up until that point in my life, and still one of the most approachable people I have ever met. Bar none. I still talk to Hayes about that lady. I'd never seen anything like that kind of anointing on somebody in that moment. The spirit was all over her. It changed us. Approachability is everything. It's everything. What if I told you the greatest and most glorious one of all history The greatest and most glorious one of all history is also the most approachable. And his greatness and his approachability, they don't war, they harmonize. Jesus Christ is the greatest and most glorious one of all history. And at the same time, the most approachable. I gotta show you, you gotta see it. Book of Hebrews is where we're at. Let's stand together and let's read this goodness right here. I love this passage. We're in Hebrews chapter four. It'll be on the screen for you. Three verses today. They're thick. I love it. Verse 14. Since then we have a great high priest. Circle the word great. We're coming back. Since then we have a great high priest. He's passed through the heavens. Underline that bad boy. Uh, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. We'll get to that. Verse 15. Y'all, this is so freeing. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near, in other words, because he's without sin, Let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Gosh, that's good stuff. Let's pray together. Father, be honored in this place. Would you set our hearts wide open to receive your word? We gotta have you. And all God's people said, you're gonna have a seat. From the very beginning of this passage, from the very beginning, you get this whole idea that there is a great high priest, apparently. If you've read a little Old Testament, you're going to dig today because it's beautiful how the Old Testament connects to the new. It is one massive narrative, one massive story, a lot of books and grain, but one massive story. And what you're going to see in verse 14 is an immediate, since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Since then we have a great high priest. Not just a high priest, but one who's great. Like smile worthy, joy inducing. 
He's the one. An immediate comparison and really an immediate contrast, scholars argue, to the old school version of the high priest. Now, here's the goal. You look at Jesus, he is the great high priest, the most glorious one. Well, what's the high priest? You have to go all the way back to Aaron, brother of Moses. Kicks off through Aaron and his sons, you get the priesthood that made up the Old Testament. It's all in that line. What you need to know about the great high priest, and this is very simple and I'm not hating on Aaron, but I need you to know that the high priests were fallible. You gotta know that they're broken. You gotta know that they're sinful. And in seeing that, you're gonna be, oh, so thankful that there is a great one who's come. Aaron, in chapter, I believe, 29 of Exodus, you don't have to turn there, but he gets consecrated. It's time to be a priest, brother, you're in. Verse 32 of Exodus, chapter 32 of Exodus, what happens? Israel grumbles, Aaron caves, and we get a calf made out of gold. Three chapters after the consecration. There is a contrasting moment here between the high priest and the qualifying word here, the great high priest. Old school tabernacle, Old Testament. You had this tabernacle uh, called the holy place. Inside the tabernacle, you had a veil that scholars argue about four inches thick would cover the most holy place, or as you guys know, like me too, holy of holies. The high priest only got to go before the Lord one time a year. One time. What about the other priest? Nope. No. Only the high priest. And his job in that moment was to sprinkle a blood sacrifice on the mercy seat. We'll come back to that, mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant in hopes that the Lord would would forgive their sin, okay? People smarter than me, here's how they say it. Gareth Cockrell, I love this. He says, under the old covenant, none could approach God's throne, the Ark of the Covenant in the most holy place, save the high priest. And he could only do that one day a year, he continues. The annual approach was with great fear. The Day of Atonement, right? The annual one time a year, Day of Atonement, was with great fear because God's throne was a place of judgment against sin. R.T. France continues this thought, perhaps our author of Hebrews already has in mind the ritual of the Day of Atonement when the high priest went behind the curtain into the Holy of Holies. By contrast, y'all, Our great high priest has gone right through the heavens itself, and that is where he is enthroned now at the right hand of the Father. So you get this picture, this whole image here of the old school high priest going into the Holy of Holies one time. I hope this works out. Don't be mad at us, Lord. I hope that you send like favor upon us and forgive our sin. And Jesus goes, I'm going to make this sacrifice once and for all. And when it's done, there are no more sacrifices after this one. This is the blood sacrifice that's always been necessary. I'm coming. I am redemption. Jesus Christ, great high priest. There's no sin in him. There's nothing sinful in him. He's the one. We don't hold out, like Travis would argue this, we don't hold out at any point in this church, Mike would argue this, a concert. That ain't it. We hold out a worship service saying that Jesus Christ is the very, very, very best. He's the most glorious. He's the greatest. And also, y'all, he's the most approachable. That's the great high priest, not just the high priest. Those dudes were messed up. They wanted, their heart was in the right spot, but they were imperfect. Rest in the one who is perfect. Great high priest has come. Continues it. Says we need to hold fast since he's our great high priest. We gotta hold fast to our confession. Interesting way to put that, author of Hebrews. Bear hug your faith. Because the great high priest is exactly who he says he is, you hold fast to the truths of the Bible. Why? The context of this moment is that Jewish Christians, according to Dr. Cockrell, Jewish Christians are under grave danger, spiritually. They're gonna drift. They're gonna buy into this false theology. Hold fast to this, the very word of the Lord. Hold fast to the great high priest. He's it. Verse 15, I love this, for we do not, y'all, 
We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But one who in every respect has been tempted as us. He didn't mess it up. If you go back maybe even two chapters, I just have to flip a page and I'll just give it to you. Hebrews 2.17. Let's talk about the humanity of Jesus it says, therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful, faithful high priest in the service of God to make a propitiation or an atonement for the sins of the people. And get this, because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. You ever see that? I love this. The old school Greek, when you dive in, says it this way. Gareth Cockrell, very, very simply, to sympathize in the old Greek, the underlying Greek word often denotes a bond stronger than our English, quote, to sympathize. It says it's stronger than that. This is a sympathy that leads to active assistance. He doesn't just go, oh, Garrett goofed it again. Uh, I love him. I love him. He's in the hug. Like, he's good. He's mine. But hopefully he makes it through. No, 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 this is the sympathy of the great high priest that goes, I know where you've been. I actually know exactly where you're at. And because I conquered it, because of my victory, I will actively assist you in your pursuit of righteousness and holiness while you are on this broken spot called earth. I'm with you. Hebrews 4.15 very simply to me says he gets it. Jesus gets us. Brothers, sisters, we don't have one who doesn't get it, who doesn't understand. On the flip side of that, we have one who absolutely gets it. One who absolutely understands exactly where you're at, all your temptations, and didn't goof it. He gets it and didn't goof it up. He's perfect, he's not a high priest. He's the great high priest. And if you're into like getting deep into the scriptures, and I know you are, there is a spot if you go to, you, we're not gonna go there now, but fun stuff after this is over. Go to Psalm 110 in verse four and look at this dude named, in the line in the order of this dude named Melchizedek, or Melchizedek, okay? Awesome line. You get to Hebrews 5, 6, and you get that same guy at the end of Hebrews 5, 6, and the Old Testament connects to the new, and you are in the line of this priest king before there were ever rules on priestly kingship in the Old Testament. It's rad, like it is one of those stunning things where I went, oh my goodness, that's truth. Psalm 110 and then Hebrews five, the great connector. It's so, so, so good. We can't get into it now, but here we go. All right, um, verse 16. It says, because Jesus is the great high priest, scholars would argue because he's victorious, that is now the foundation for your confidence. Like, your confidence and my confidence is not founded on my wins. Chelsea's right there. She would argue for, like, my lack of, like, wins in life most. I, I goof it up all the time. I'm imperfect. I look like Aaron. Thus, I need Jesus. I got to have him. And when I'm walking with the great high priest, I'm a better husband. I'm a better dad. I can preach better when the spirit, and I'm in tune with him, and it goes. But he's saying, because of Christ's victory, we're gonna draw near, we're going to approach with confidence. We're gonna draw near with confidence. We're not gonna be scared of this throne any longer. What do you mean we're not scared of the throne any longer? In the Old Testament, right? In the Holy of Holies, priests would come in and hope that the Lord would forgive their sin. Blood offering sprinkled on the mercy seat. What brought about great fear in the Old Testament, Jesus changes the name of the throne. He says, no, this, this throne in this moment is a throne of grace. Like a, a throne of grace. He could have named it anything else. He says, no, no more fear here. I've paid the price. Come to me. All you who are weary, and I'll give you rest. You need rest this morning? Physically, spiritually, mentally, all of the elise. Jesus is it. He's your rest, and he comes in 
and said, come get your mercy. The mercy seat takes on a whole new name. And the cool thing is, is that you and I, if we follow Jesus, if we've given us, given him our lives, we're allowed in. He's paved the way for us. That's how we do it. Approach. What if I told you that very simply, very simply, the most glorious one and the greatest one is also the most approachable one. My favorite book in the last two years outside of this book is a book called Gentle and Lowly. A guy named Dane Ortland wrote it. And in talking about you get to Matthew, I think it's eleven twenty nine. 29, Jesus gives us a quick bio of who he is. Quick bio. And he says, one thing in the scripture, I am gentle and I am lowly. I've always understood the gentle part, never really got the lowly part. Here's what Dane says. The point in saying that Jesus is lowly, get this y'all, is that he is accessible. For all his resplendent glory and dazzling holiness, his supreme uniqueness and otherness, no one in human history has ever been more approachable than Jesus Christ. Ever. Ever. The fear is not from him. He calls it a throne of grace. It changes everything completely in that moment. And I'll just ask you this, like, what does it do to your heart maybe? Like down deep in here, your soul, your very being to know that the one worthy of all the glory in the whole world made a way so that you, you, you could approach him moment by moment, day by day. The most glorious and greatest one ever, also the most approachable. Changes things. You might be saying, it's a good question. So what? It's fair. I don't think you're asking it rudely. I think, okay, what do we do now? This means two things. One, you can look like him. His spirit implanted in you, conformed to his image, your approachability can be there too. You can look like him. First thing, most more importantly, you can know him. Give your life to him. Have the Holy Spirit installed into your soul, leading, guiding, directing. Yes, convicting. All right, what about the convicting part? That's good. He's pointing you to something better. I'll tell you this. If, if a hallmark of Matthew 11, Jesus gives us a verse on who he is down most deeply. He says, I'm gentle and I'm approachable. Approachable, y'all, that's got to be us. That's got to be us. He's saying, gee, I've never really, like, if I'm going to have a Twitter bio or Instagram bio or whatever those things are, and you're going, I've got a bio, yours may not say firsthand, that guy's approachable, or that lady is approachable, or that student, that may not be a hallmark of your disposition, of your personality's approachability. And you're going, Garrett, I love Jesus, but people drive me nuts. You laugh because you're there. I love Jesus, like, I love Jesus, but have you met that guy? Do you know that person? They're on the complete other side of the argument that I've got. And I, I just can't do it. I'm with you. And Jesus comes in in this moment as only he knows how and he goes, I'm with you too. Down deep in here as a follower. And I will change and move in you to the point where he starts pruning and approachability rises to the top. Because have you seen culture? Have you seen our friends in our city and what it looks like to be on social media in today's world? Everybody's just angry. Everybody's mad. Like it's sad in a lot of ways. And what's happened is our social media have circles, uh, have spilled into our social circles in person. And here's what some people are looking, approachability in this moment unlocks the power of the gospel. It's the lady in the hospital that we expected to find something completely different and to minister, and she showed us Jesus Christ in a way I had never seen. Approachability is everything. It's in Jesus' bio in Matthew 11. He's paved the way. He's gone through the heavens so that we become, let's just get this right really, really clearly, and I'm, I'm hurrying. If you're a Christian in this room, your name is Little Christ, which means you look like him and I look like him. We've got to model this whole idea of approachability and you're going, okay, cool, I got you, how? It's a good question. How do I do it? 
I don't have seven steps. I don't have three. I honestly don't even have two, but I got one. In order to become more approachable so the gospel gets out, you and I have to go sit with the one who is most approachable. Amen. That's it. For you to be, and I to be more approachable, you just got to go sit with the one who is most approachable. And moment by moment and day by day, he prunes you. And he marks your heart with his countenance. And then maybe somebody sitting in a truck after meeting you going, what was that about? I can't even fathom what just happened. But he and she had the aroma of Christ on them. I want to know Jesus the way they know Jesus. And approachability unlocks the door for the gospel. The throne of grace is for you. You can approach today. You can know him and you can look like him. 